films back then serve the same purpose that video served today. You know, you, you travel around the world to Japan or to different parts of Asia and Europe and South America and Australia and um, hip hop culture and just uh, black American culture is very prevalent. And that's where it comes from. Back in the 70s, there were no music videos, so it was the black mutation film. One of the great things about black exploitation was the music and, and the, the fact that it gave so many black uh, musicians and stars of that time these great moments to work in the music industry and to represent in a certain kind of way. Maybe the music is most memorable, you know what I mean, like uh, just like the, the scores, there'll be, you know, such elaborate scores for, for these films and, you know, done by serious musicians and composers. The fact that they took a chance on a young and up-and-coming um, music conductor like Willie Hutch, you know, to do these soulful, you know, gangster chase scene type music. I mean, he really had to know what he was doing and they trusted him to do it and, it, it, you know, it all, it all melded together and came out right. I mean, they could have easily picked Curtis Mayfield to do these things or even James Brown for that matter. But, you know, they took a chance on a Motown artist like Willie Hutch, and he made some classic joints to this day. I mean, we still sample that, you know, that music. Most people who make music and movies right now, they grew up watching that, you know what I'm saying? So it was a, it was a major influence. If you look at our history in entertainment and media, we're much more developed, almost overdeveloped, as musicians. Most of these gangster rap albums or whatnot, it's, it's just a modern day black exploitation film on, on record, you know? Because all we doing is, is, is talking about the shit that go on in the hood. People may think we glorifying it or whatnot, but we really just telling what's going on, just like they was just telling what was going on at the time, you know, they just put it on movies. An extension of a black exploitation film would be like a Minister Society or a Boys in the Hood or, you know what I'm saying, movies like that was just, you know, just, just show what was going on in that era. Films is based on the streets, so rap is based on the streets too. It's some music that was formed from the streets where we didn't have no musical instruments, so we had to make two turntables, and we, you know, we got a record that we liked, and we cut it up, and we made a loop with it, and started putting nice words to it, and people started dancing to it. I mean, it's a, it was a poor man's music, you know what I'm saying? Which became popular. Same thing with black exploitation. It was poor man's film, it was about the ghetto, the hood, and whatever, 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 and it became popular. Same thing, you know what I'm saying? It's independent, baby, it's, it's, our, it's our culture, it's black culture, man, to the fullest, man, and we ain't got too much culture left. Yeah, a lot of the swag, a lot of the just the hip, jive, cool, you know, pimp shit, you know what I'm saying? They seem like they're going back to the 70s with the girls and the fur coats and, you know, the guys being kind of like pimps and stuff like that. I just wish they would let the girls kick a little bit more butt in the videos because if that was Pam and Pam was in the video, oh, she would come through and be whooping a whole bunch of people's butt, driving the car, shooting the guns, and then going off with the lady man. So their influence that are in the hip-hop culture is fashion-wise and how sexy the girls are. Black exploitation films permeate hip-hop culture. Uh, a lot of the characters that rappers assume, you know, the, the characters you see Snoop Dogg assume, Foxy Brown named herself after a, a black exploitation character. Yeah, I remember being about four or five years old and always watching the black having a fascination with the black exploitation movies and just always being fascinated with Pam Greer, the person, the character, everything about her. And I decided if I ever became famous, that I would want to adapt the whole Foxy Brown aura and persona. 
They represent cool. They represent people in control, people that will fight against, uh, against um, you know, oppression, and they will stick it to the man. That's like exactly what hip hop culture is all about. They gave people the right to make movies for, about, and starring black women. Because before, or even during and a little bit after, it was like nobody believed in making movies about black women. Like that wasn't a target audience that people would go for. In hip hop, those movies had a big influence from people using the music from those movies to, to people using the names from those movies. And just Pam Grier had an influence on especially a lot of First of all, a lot of male artists love the way she looked and, and she really appealed to us. But then the female artists, some of them patterned themselves after Pam Grier. So she's had a big influence. Those are movies we watch. Those are a common thread. Like, you know, certain things that most hip hop cats or people in our generation are in tune with. And Foxy Brown and Pam Grier is one of those. If you look at all the music videos, you look at all the girls in hip hop right now, all of them are basically wearing all the outfits and doing all the things that Pam Grid did in her movies. You know, it was like, she was the first badass. She was the first chick that stood up and was like, nah, if I want something, I'm gonna whoop your ass for it. You mess with me, you gonna get this. I mean, basically the whole woman that hip hop is emulating right now. Speaking from myself, Lauryn Hill, Jay-Z, the artist, who, who've arrived in the business. I think we all have a great deal of respect for Pam Grier and just, with me, I try to emulate a lot that she does. I mean, no one can ever be Pam Grier again, but like I always give it up. She's the OG Foxy, I'm the baby Foxy. You know, the whole woman, you know, in the music videos and in the movies, that's just like, you know, I'm out for mine. I mean, if you mess with my family, I'm at you. This is the end of your rotten life, you motherfucking dope pusher. You know, she was a woman, but she really had a, a male, you know, characteristic about her. You know, she was very on her guard and very up to par, but she was very feminine. You know, even though she ran around and pulled her gats and fought people, at no point in time did you not feel that she wasn't a woman or she wasn't sexy. So she gives you that aggressive nature that is really showing up in hip hop right now. So much of hip hop uh, pays uh, homage to black exploitation that the younger brothers can see a, a, a chain of uh, transmission and culture that comes through. And the big part goes to those white men who corrupt our law enforcement agencies. And the big part goes to those white men who draft our black boys and send them over to Indochina. Taking it to the man and bringing down the system and bringing it to, to whoever, whoever was doing wrong. Uh, what's the trouble, officer? It's plenty of trouble for you, Spook. Unless you turn right around and go back where you came from. Oh, yes, sir. We sure don't want no trouble. And neither do you, do you, White? Yes, sir, I sure don't. And plus the soundtracks to it was kind of dope, too. Super bad. Dig it. Music really kind of set the tone of what the fashion would look like. And I think, if anything, hip hop sort of took a cue from that. The whole pimps and max thing definitely have an influence on hip hop. Those black exploitation films, the style was the 70s, you know, and that soulful style really has come back from people rocking polyester stuff to, you know, just bigger collars or whatever, you know. It's, it, it's came back around, the, the hats and everything, so. I mean, it's, it's just, it's had a big influence on the music to the style, and yeah. the brother out the tight pants you know <laughs> you know what i mean the way people dress though i mean this jacket and I'm, I'm sure this jacket who the guy who designed this jacket um he had to be thinking about the 70s when he did this shit a lot of the stuff the hip-hop in the hip-hop fashions 
it's not original, it's been around before. You know, fashion is a vicious cycle. It's just in a different time. You know, look, take for instance the, the um, espadrilles and the, the platform shoes and the wedgies. You know, that's been around before. The big flared skirts, the bell-bottom pants, the jewel denims. You know, it's just coming out in a different time with a different flavor and a different twist. Foxy Brown. She had on the blue, like, little two-piece when she was uh, trying to seduce the judge. Over with. Or when the, uh, the white, like, crochet swimsuit she had on the two-piece. I mean, that's, you know, that's timeless right there. You can't, you can't buy that. The pimp style was in, the Mac, you know, all that flamboyant stuff. That era was just all about dressing fly. And like it was the who's who in, in, in fashion for black people, you know. You tuned in to people like Pam Grier and Antonio Fargus and, and Max Julian. And, you know, when they was wearing the, the, the cool blazers with the suede elbows and the, the turtlenecks and the, the bell bottoms and, the, you know, the, the stack, you know what I'm saying, the uh, elevator shoes. What stands out in my mind is the Afro, Pam Grier specifically. She was the queen of the Afro. She was so larger than life. It was at a time where there was this whole black power thing happening and women wanted to be empowered. I want you to suffer. And she moved with such, you know, such power and authority. It was definitely empowering. So to see her as a superhero and a female, you know, that was quite significant. Before that, women were very conservative. They were very, you know, closed off to the world around them. Now she jumped out with her like full breasts and nice hips and, you know, just overwhelming body and this beautiful face. And then it was like, yo, I am allowed to do that. You know, that is sexy. That is womanly. There was nobody else doing that. You didn't see it anywhere. So it had to come from somewhere. So you seeing these fabulous fashions on the screen, of course it had an impact. I mean, in high school, everybody wore the bell bottoms and stuff like that. They saw this image and you really adapt to what you see on the screen. That, it, it still happens today. And designers were not open and receptive to black stars wearing their clothes. They were not a lot of black stars. So of course you had to go into your closet. So it's a lot of her own personal wardrobe came into play. They bought their clothing from their own closets. See, that lets you know why they look so good. First of all, they probably didn't have the budget. <laughs> Let's start there. So, you know, the actors were probably working actors that had went out and got some fabulous furs and some nice dresses and stuff. You know, that's one thing you can say about African Americans. They can be broke, but baby, they gonna be clean. Fashion is gonna be happening. You can forget about it. They might not have rent that's gonna pay, but when they show up, they gonna be clean. It's back around. We see people rocking the, the, and taking the name, so you can tell it's, it's, the influence is heavy. And people like Pam Greer, she laid the groundwork. She was one of the fashion icons. And it all had to do with that whole wave of freedom in dress. This is something that came from the street, very much the same way the hip hop trends are coming now from the streets. You know, nobody else was doing what she was doing before, after, or doing. You know, we really haven't had a black female action figure, you know what I mean, in cinematic history other than her. I think what the release of these DVDs will do for hip hop culture in general is that a lot of the younger fans will get an opportunity to sort of see where all of the inspiration comes from. There's a lot of people who, you know, young cats, 16, 17, 18 years old right now, who have no knowledge of that, you know what I'm saying, that part of the game. So I just feel like it'll be informative and insightful for them, you know? There's a lot of people that don't even know that before me, there was someone else who paved the way who I aspire to be. You know, whether it's things that Snoop does or things where like, oh, is that where Foxy Brown got her name from? Or is that where the idea of a ride and die chick came from? Like all those elements that sort of make up hip hop, I think these younger fans will get an opportunity to see this sort of history. This DVD collection will absolutely um, educate a younger audience. I think a lot of people know about Pam Greer, but for you guys to release these films, it will educate them about the importance of the time period, what she did. I mean, for like three to five years, she absolutely ruled. She was like one of the first female herons. But the game ain't over yet, bitch. She carried the film. She got budgets for five different films. They realize how hard it is for an African-American female to greenlight a film and to get the budget. Nowadays, the fact that back in the day, I'm gonna break them down to you guys. Look at this, one, two, three, four, five. She got budgets from 
1973, I mean, on up, and every single one of them, I mean, you know, she's great, from coffee, to Friday Foster, to my all-time favorite, Foxy Brown. Quentin Tarantino said that coffee is one of the most entertaining movies ever made. And that was one of the reasons why when we did Kill Bill, why he started one of the first incredible fight scenes off with a black girl and a white girl was because he wanted it to set the tone of the movie. He said a lot of people would be, oh my God, they killed Vivica off first. He said, but he wanted to, to show just how entertaining and how much the audience will be drawn in to see two girls, two badass girls, really kicking some butt and it wasn't a lot of wires and trickery. And I said, well, Quentin, where were you influenced? He goes, Pam Greer movies. Absolutely, Pam Greer movies totally influenced that fight scene. These DVDs are just as important as re-releasing, you know, some other classics like Gone with the Wind or something like that because those are historical figures and historical films that left their mark on cinema just like Pam Greer did.